<laughs> so what happened was we built this crappy scanner um, and then I posted some stuff on the internet and like I was, the guys in the office were there was like three of us that were all sort of you know sharing an office and they were like oh that's you know that's never gonna work no one's gonna want that you know joking about this stupid thing that we've done and literally like the phone just started ringing and I was like like everyone was ringing up asking for scans and it was mad like I've never seen anything like it it must have rang like three or four times a day after I posted it on Facebook um, so we just ended up like building a scanning company. You're listening to Art Heroes Podcast, the show to help you thrive as a digital artist. Tune in to learn how to transform your passion into a career. Get inspired by other kick-ass 2D and 3D artists and find out what it takes to be an art hero. Hello, hello, everyone. This is Maria JD. I'm your host at Art Heroes Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And today's guest at Art Heroes Podcast is James Busby from 1024. James actually started as a 3D artist himself as early as in 2002 and then started his own business 1024 in 2008. Since then, 1024 worked on various AAA games and then finally became what it is now, the company for 3D scanning and photogrammetry. What happens then, 1024 actually gave birth to two other businesses, which is a 3D scan store and Anatomy 360. You've probably been on one of these websites, so you know what James is busy with. But today, our conversation will be all about 3D scanning, the technology and opportunities for artists in it. Let's dive into it. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We've got James Busby today. James, thanks so much for coming on the show. No problem. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And yes, I've got so many questions actually that are just fighting in my head. And uh, uh, guys, uh, today I'm going to remind everyone we're talking about 3D scanning and not only. We're also talking about James a little bit. If James, if, James, if James doesn't mind. No, that's fine by me. You can, yeah. yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right, James. So uh, live from Sheffield. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, and that's uh, 1024 headquarters. Yeah, yeah. We're just in a little uh, leafy suburb of Sheffield called Broom Hill. Uh, I love that. And we see the leafy part in the background as well. Oh, but it's fake. It's, <laughs> it's... <laughs> okay, then I hope the rest of the leafy yeah. part is better. Yeah. That, that would have died a long time ago, but it was real. <laughs> That happens frequently with studio mascots. <laughs> All right, James. So let's just uh, get started. And actually, like uh, my first, uh, my first question would be, um, how did the whole thing in the industry start for you? And you know, like, uh, where did you come from to start Ten Twenty Four? Well, like I mean, so very early on, um, I started. I think when I was about sixteen, I started playing with Three D Studio. It wasn't even like Three D Studio Max. Um, and then I kind of quite young, I started making 3D models and messing around with texturing and stuff like that. Um, and then I went to university and I studied film and media. Um, I think I wanted to be a journalist, but that didn't really work. Um, so I started making animations and little movies and things. Um, and basically taught myself proper, you know, how to model and animate and render and all that sort of stuff at uni. Um, and then I graduated with my, I did my final year project, which was like an animated film. And I won the uh, British Animator of the Year award or whatever it was, which was quite chuffed. And then wow. I immediately got a job in the games industry at a company called Argonaut Games. Um, and I did sort of track design and environments and characters. Um, and then I quit there after about two years. And then I went to work for a company called Arc VFX. Um, and we did sort of, I was like a TD there and I did sort of uh, character art and all this various sorts of roles because it was quite a small company. Um, and then after about five years, I quit that and then I started 1024 in 2008. Wow, that's yeah. already, that's already an old company for the industry. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, it's 11 I mean, years old now, I think. <laughs> geez, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, that's definitely not a teenager in company no, no. standards. 
No, I honestly thought it would have gone bust by now. Like when I started, <laughs> I didn't think it would last like two years. <laughs> well, it lasted for a bit longer than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Good job. Well, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So was it, um, was it from the beginning focused on what it is focused now? Was it doing like 3D scanning like very early on or what was it like? No, not at all. It was so when I left my previous company, I wanted to focus on kind of high end character models for studios. So I used to do a lot of work for Axis Animation um, and I was quite integrated into their pipeline. So I could work on their models with their topology and their texture pipeline and, you know, have everything sort of integrate quite easily. Um, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, but the problem was that the things were progressing so quickly and it was only me that I couldn't actually turn around enough um i couldn't make the characters fast enough if you know what i mean for the yeah, for their sort of production of pipeline course. so i started um, experimenting with scanning and you know a couple of cameras i bought a little handheld arctex scanner which the guy agreed to let me pay for because i had no money and like, i had to sell my car um and he let me pay for it like 200 quid a month or something for three three years it's <laughs> some crazy <laughs> amount of time <laughs> and it was crap you know it was a black and white thing and it was all right, but I started doing a bit of scanning and then getting into cameras, used a couple of cameras and started experimenting with photogrammetry. And that, to me, wasn't it wasn't necessarily going to be a scanning business. All I wanted to do was speed up the character production pipeline a bit. Um, so, you know, I could get decent face scans and, you know, get the textures off them and build characters. Um, but yeah, then my business partner, Chris, he kind of came along and, you know, remortgaged his house and you know, we bought loads of cameras. <laughs> we bought nine cameras, I think. So we kind of nine built it cameras. Up. So, yeah, that was the original original scanner. <clears throat> so initially, did it work eventually to speed up your uh, production pipeline or no? No, it did. Well, it did. So what <laughs> happened was we built this crappy scanner um, and then I posted some stuff on the internet and like, uh, the guys in the office were there was like three of us that were all sort of you know sharing an office and they were like oh that's you know that's never gonna work no one's gonna want that you know joking about this stupid thing that we've done and literally like the phone just started ringing and i was like like everyone was ringing up asking for scans and it was mad like i've never seen anything like it it must have rang like three or four times a day after i posted it on facebook and um, so we just ended up like building a scanning company <laughs> and so and so who were the first customers then for the scanning uh it was i think the first customers were axis i think and then uh sega um did some stuff with this in fact no sorry sega uh, creative assembly were actually the first uh scanning um job that we had a proper one and then things like bbc um we did a load of stuff on like all the sort of rubbish BBC, you know, like um, Doctor Who and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Love how you call it but, rubbish, but yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm sure like <laughs> the whole world will disagree with me. but <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> all right. So, and then the nine cameras, do you still work with the same equipment or how frequently do you actually change the equipment? Because like the uh, whole technology advances so fast. Yeah, definitely. And the cameras have a, have a lifespan. I mean, it's a mechanical shutter that opens and closes, so that will eventually break. So, yeah, I mean, we update the cameras. Um, we add new ones all the time. Um, you know, it's just a, a case of what works, you know, and it's expensive now because we've got, you know, 180 on the rig and, you know, load more on another rig that we've got. And whenever those break, it's not as sometimes it's a case of you can't get that camera anymore because it's, you know, Canon don't make the 200Ds or the 100Ds or whatever. So you've got to replace them all. Mm -hmm. So instead of replacing one or two cameras, you've got to replace a hundred cameras, which is, oh, no. you know, it's quite a, a bit of a, bit of a shock yeah. system. <laughs> so like how much equipment do you actually have now in the studio? Like, is it, you know, the whole like hunger or? <laughs> The whole what, sorry? <laughs> like a hangar of the equipment? Oh, a hangar? Like, oh, yeah. No, it's not like a hangar, no. It's a, it's quite a big room. It's about seven metres by ten metres or something in the room. But it's um, there's 180 cameras on a big sort of like kind of truss system that we've yeah. built that, that goes around. Um, wow. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fairly simple photogrammetry system by modern standards, but, you know, it works for us. Um, and do you do all the, all the scanning in-house or do you ever have to relocate your equipment to do it on site we used to back in back in the day with our like sort of mo because we had so few cameras we could kind of just put them in a box and take them somewhere and then but we'd always get clients and we'd say we need a white room 
we need no natural light you know we need something you know perfect for scanning and we'd end up in like a i don't know like an old tesco's warehouse or like one time we were in like a a castle and like <laughs> it's just amazing that's a yeah, great, yeah. <laughs> great work environment no yeah well it was but it's not very good for for photography if you know what i mean because you've got yeah. gray walls and <laughs> the sun streaming in from one side so it was um yeah it, we stopped doing the mobile stuff because we just we'd rather have a controlled environment which is here that we can get the results that we want and you know it's we'd much rather be able to say to our clients you know pay for your active to come here because you'll get a better result than if you pay for us to go to you if you know what i mean so we yeah. can quality control that way really yeah and i'm sure our clients would prefer a better quality to exactly and also it's a, it's a lot cheaper to send an actor here than it is for us to lug 180 cameras to Bristol, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, um, what's the, um, I asked you before, before we actually started the recording, but I have to ask this again. So what's the, um, split of the project, uh, when we're talking about the actual like scanning time versus post-production? Um, it's, well, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on, what the what the deliverables are for the project so i mean we specialize in creating really high resolution characters for studios for their pipeline basically um so if we were to take for example like one head scan and we were to build that into you know super high resolution with all the pore details and you know pbr textures and eyelashes and eyeball all, all the stuff and um, that can take around about four days and the scanning itself takes about 20 minutes uh -oh. so i mean you know it, it's like a small percentage it could be like one percent even but sometimes the, the client will just want us to just give them a hard drive full of photographs you know and that'll be a hundred percent of the work just be clicking the button and taking the, mm -hmm. the scans and sometimes they'll want somewhere in between which is you know scanning and then um, a little bit of cleanup work maybe retopology and then it's about you know sort of 80 percent uh, post work 20 percent mm -hmm. scanning so it depends really on the client. Okay, but still it's like a small percentage of your work is actually like scanning and then most of it is definitely um, like work of artists. Oh, 100%, yeah. So we could scan, I mean, we just finished scanning for the scan store. Um, we just did a massive session. It was about, I don't know how many scans it was, over a thousand, well over a thousand. And that only took uh, three weeks. So that's given us wow. enough work now for probably two years worth of, you know, creative likes. <laughs> work for us you know artistic sort of stuff yeah and is there something like a typical project for you um in terms of for ourselves or for a client yeah, for or... for a client yeah um yeah typically what they usually want is uh good well so i'll explain a little bit so our scanner is a little bit different in well probably everyone has this now but it's a full body scanner and also a head scanner in the same system so our clients tend to want a full body scan like a neutral you know sort of t pose a pose and then we do a neutral head and then we do a lot of facts. So up to, you know, sometimes 70, but usually about 30 kind of different facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And then for us, the generally the work on that is cleaning up and retopologizing the body and the head um, and then providing raw facts, mm -hmm. which is just the process uh, expressions with the texture mm -hmm. on them. And that's it really, that's sort yeah. of a general one. <clears throat> and okay. hands, we do a lot of hands. And so um, since we have a lot of artists listening and like watching uh, this podcast at the moment, um, I would also like be asking on their behalf, uh, what's, you know, like what's the typical artist profile that you guys hire? And in this industry, uh, what type of artists are specifically like required for the jobs that, uh, that are done at the moment with 3D scanning? And what's yeah. that that you're looking in the artist? Is it all like character artists or? Um, yeah, we generally look for character artists. And that's, you know, 100% of the people we employ or we okay. use as contractors or character artists um, generally. So the problem that we have with scanning is it's kind of, it's the kind of job that doesn't actually require uh, an awful lot. Well, no, hang on, that's wrong. Uh, it's a very skillful job cleaning up a, a character yeah. head and making it look really really nice you know it's, it's something only a really skilled character artist can do well but it's also not the kind of job that a really skilled character artist wants to do because it can be it can be quite boring and tedious and it's not creating something if you know what i mean it's just you know sort of polishing something that's already yeah, there attention to details and yeah. anatomy and... except so it's something for it's something that 
character artists who really enjoy things like um you know like skin pore creation and you know all the really sort of technical stuff you know like hyper realism kind yeah. of thing and um, and that those are generally the kind of people that sort of work for us like Celine who was on earlier that's his sort of speciality and it's kind of but there's not very many people that can do it well yeah. um but yeah it's a it's a weird one a lot of details yeah mm -hmm. and so um like if you can speak about that um what is the you know what's the typical pipeline or like you know like the typical software that you require for artists well i mean i guess like uh, zbrush right but uh what else yeah uh, basically, what else do they need to master <laughs> Zbr zbrush <laughs> Um, the, the skill in, in cleaning uh, scans is extracting detail from the texture maps and, and creating, you know, kind of poor level displacements and things and figuring out how to make those into something that doesn't just look like a, you know, like a bumpy sort of, um, you know, like surface of a crater. Um, so the two main bits of software are Photoshop and ZBrush. Um, right. And that's all we really need for cleanup. Um, that, that, mm -hmm. That's all we use, really. Uh, we use a little bit of body paint sometimes just to clean up seams and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like that, but nothing. So, like, do you think there is any, like, you know, lack of supply of artists and how do you select artists? Oh, okay. So, um, like, what do you look for in a portfolio or do you only take people by recommendation? Um, do you even pay attention to their previous jobs and, uh, you know, like yeah. the typical, like, LinkedIn um, thing? Or yeah. for you, like portfolio is more important. So what are the indicators for you? Um, I think for us, the, the main indicator is sculpting ability. So people who are, you know, exceptional at sculpting faces and anatomy in general, it doesn't have to be human anatomy, it just has to be an understanding of, you know, anatomy. Um, because that's quite a big part of uh, kind of sympathetically cleaning a scan. So, you know, if you've got a face that's covered in noise um, or, you know, a bit of the nose is missing or something, the sort of the things that I see a lot with scans is someone just getting the smooth brush and just kind of smoothing over it, which it's not really how you do it. If you know what I mean, you need yeah, to yeah, definitely. maintain that like a underlying anatomy and that, you know, everything works. So our main, the, the thing that we really look for are talented sculptors and um, all the sort of skin pore stuff that, that can all easily, we've got a pipeline for that. You know, we can show people how to do that. Um, in terms of uh, supply, lack of supply of artists, yeah. um, because we're quite a small company and we tend to do quite niche, small jobs, um, we do, we do, we're not one of those companies that goes around constantly trying to hire people. You know, we, we, we quite like it when somebody comes to us and says, hey, you know, can I work for you? You know, I can do this. And that's generally how it's worked in the past. Um, I don't really? know if I've ever actually really poached anyone or gone up to someone and gone, you know, hey, do you want to do this? Um, because we, we're always looking for people like we, we always are looking for anyone who can do a really good job and we'll you know usually give them work if, if you know if they can do it um but yeah i, I don't really go around yeah sort of looking for do you artists. give like uh art tests or something for people no. to prove themselves not 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 generally usually you can tell by someone's portfolio quite quickly you know whether they're good or not um, okay i think yeah so what would be your like general recommendation who like to an artist who's never let's say worked in the industry and uh, um you know really wants to break through uh what do you think they need to do uh, to their portfolio to showcase uh what to get scanning work or... yeah to get scanning work and to work with characters in you know like with so for example to get hired by a studio yeah. like yours <laughs> Well, I think I think scanning is kind of becoming quite a commonplace thing now within at most like a realistic character pipelines. Um, so it's rare now that you'll see somebody really sort of sculpting something from scratch. Although obviously people do still do it and it's still, you know, still a job. Um, but yeah, I think um, in terms of what they should have in their portfolios to demonstrate that, I think, um, you know, if you email me, I can send you a scan and you can use it as a, you know, a sort of a portfolio mm -hmm. piece to clean it up and, you know, I'm quite happy to do that. I always do when people ask. Um, but I think that demonstrating uh, the process from a raw to a final mm -hmm. production ready model, and I think things that are really important are things like topology and you know creating the the mouth properly and the teeth and you know shading and mm -hmm. creating skin pores and you know everything that would apply to probably a real time pipeline these days is the, is the main one. Yeah, um, definitely. But yeah, just creating a believable, realistic character. 
because it's harder than it looks. It's not just a case of pressing a button and the scan comes mm -hmm. out and it's done. You know, there's a lot of stuff that it needs to be done to yeah. integrate something into, you know, like a proper render, real time render. Yeah. Did you learn all of this by yourself or did you have like a mentor, an instructor or something? Um, I, well, I worked at a games company where, you know, I was young. I was like 21 yeah. or something. So I had a lot of people. Yeah, I was just going around asking questions. <laughs> um, but yeah. And then at my second company, Arc VFX, I worked with some really talented guys. Um, and, I, you know, I was just sort of it was constantly just asking questions and, you know, trying to figure out how to do stuff. And I worked with a guy called Rich Wright, who was a really, really cool characterized um i think he mm -hmm. does mostly 2d stuff now but he taught me a lot of a lot of things i learned a lot from him mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but yeah in terms of the scanning pipeline stuff that's all been sort of self-taught i mean there wasn't mm -hmm. when we started there wasn't really anyone doing it there was us and infinite realities and di4d yeah exactly and the industry yeah, is so new yeah there wasn't there was nothing no nothing to learn you know you couldn't yeah. figure on how, how to do this to scan how to get you know it wasn't a thing so everything's sort of our own kind of pipeline mm -hmm. really interesting love that and so um where do you see like you like where do you see uh the uh, technology going further from where we are because you know like you've seen it develop from zero almost yeah. mm -hmm. to um getting enough work for 1024 for as we said like uh, just, exactly <laughs> or more than that like yeah. <laughs> you know like every everybody needs to be 3d scanned and there's so, like yes seven billion people in the world um yeah exactly so, oh, jesus so <laughs> um so what do you think will happen next um so i think there's two routes there's two mm -hmm. paths probably um so the first thing we're probably going to see is and people are already doing it um like you know the whole 4d i think you mentioned it earlier so motion scanning, which, you know, it's it's really good for capturing facts and, you know, performances and things. It's a little bit difficult in terms of editing. It's kind of a one trick kind of pony, like you shoot and you process it and you've got your performance. But there are, you know, you can extract facts from it and you can use those to create rigs. And, you know, it's quite a good way, especially if you've got higher resolution um, scans. Uh, Lee at Infinite Realities is doing some pretty cool stuff. He's got a really high res kind of 4D mm, scanner at yeah. the moment. Um, the other thing that's probably going to happen is AI is probably going to decimate the scanning market quite quickly once it gets going, I would imagine. And that's probably in no small part to do with sort of the stuff that we're doing with ScanStore, which is building libraries. So if you can give an AI a thousand retopologized scans and it can, and you can say the, well, so say you could give an AI a scan and say the scan is generated from this image. And then you can do that a thousand times. Theoretically, you could give the AI just an image of like Tom Cruise, and then it would reconstruct, you know, a scan based on the training set that it had before. So I imagine that's probably the way it will eventually go. There will be a button. Okay. <laughs> the, <laughs> the mythical CG sad. make character button will happen. Yeah, it is sad. It's hard. It's it's not a nice thought, but it's you know, it's kind of an economics led thing. Like studios yeah. will want it, and mm -hmm. someone will build it. But uh, do you think at some point we'll get to the situation when there is uh, less work for ar artists because the technology is so good or um, there still will be something to work on as of, you know, like specifically for 3D artists, even though the technology is good? I think it'll change. I think it's, um, it's quite easy to be pessimistic about it, but I think the jobs will just sort of change, if you know what I mean. So jobs now won't, that are a big thing now, like creating heads that probably won't exist in 10 years. You know, I, I can definitely see there being an automated process for doing that sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, but probably it'll just mean there'll be different jobs. You know, I don't really know what those are going to be. Um, and I don't really know how the sort of kind of the, the landscape's going to change for artists. Um, but I mean, you can see it already. I mean, you can see automation, how it's affected the industry already. I mean, it's kind of like motion capture like that that's i mean it hasn't decimated the animation industry at all but it's definitely augmented the and made things a lot easier for people um so yeah i honestly i don't know how to answer that question yeah I can't, no I can't but really... i think you did answer actually like and uh, i i do agree with you that jobs always evolve 
Yeah. But uh, we just have to kind of, uh, you know, like watch it closely and see where the technology takes us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, you know, like you, with the, the new technology, you built the whole company and, uh, you know, the company even evolved already because yeah. the technology evolved. So exactly. there's no, like, there is no easy answer anyway. It's just no. even now open. Yeah. You have to just wait and see. But I mean, you can kind of follow trends and you can kind of look at things and see what's happened in the past. And I think, I think a heavily automated yeah. pipeline yeah. is probably the way things are going to go in the future. But mm -hmm. It might all go wrong, you know. AIs might make horrible characters. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, like I'm pretty sure until AI makes amazing characters, there will be, you know, still exactly. like five, ten years of opportunities. Easily, easily, I think. I mean, if yeah. you look at what it's churning out at the minute, I mean, it's it's terrible. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you I've know. I've seen some examples. Yes, I yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, even even things that would you would think could like destroy the character, the sort of industry like Daz and you know those sort of automated character makers, where you just say you know give it blonde hair and give it blue eyes, and they mm -hmm. you know that they're not good characters. They're <sighs> weird. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, there's yeah. still something that we humans do better. Yeah, exactly. And I yeah, and it's all nuanced stuff. I mean, I think we really pick up on, you know, the sort of like finer details of a face. And I think yeah. that's, you know, something yeah. very human. Yeah, no, for sure. And also there is this bit of technology when, you know, like our hype and expectations about it are so like over the roof. And then mm. uh, like look at, I don't know, even 3D printing. Like yeah. now we would expect to have everything 3D printed. Yeah. But <laughs> the reality is that it's still like, collectibles and rare items exactly yeah so. yeah you're right like 3d tv all, all that sort of yeah. stuff it's kind of a little bit like it, it had well i don't know like vr as well in, in yeah vr it seems to just yeah. sort of piece it off it's like all like taking off and it's not yeah. really mm. at the consumer level so mm. not even like at very very impressive level yeah so no probably expected to be better yeah maybe it will be but i think it's, yeah yeah, I think things um, take longer. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have another question about uh, 3D scanning as a technology, um, mm -hmm. because you work so much for this, and I'm sure you've seen like such a variety of, uh, um, you know, of uh, implementation of it, like different scopes. So I'm just curious in general, what people use 3D scanning for, because entertainment industry is an obvious shot. Um, where you know like you need a digital double or like you know like where you 3d scan an actor like yeah. um what is i don't know like if you have any examples of other projects uh, or maybe something like absolutely ridiculous where you wouldn't expect 3d scanning to play a role um yeah i mean it gets used in all sorts of random things i mean one the the other big industry that no one really thinks about is uh, product design so like people who make you know sunglasses and headphones and face masks and you know all that stuff they all use like um well a lot of them buy our scans off our store and like use them to model their new products on work helmets everyone uses them for yeah. work helmets um th there's all sorts of things uh like the entertainment industry definitely makes up the bulk of of their use um yeah i don't know i mean there's um there's the medical industry as well, use them for certain things. We did a lot of stuff for boots for uh, skin testing. And so oh, really? They, How would yeah, that work? Well, they were trying to build, so we scanned loads and loads of people for them, and they were trying to build a sort of a virtual makeup kind of tester. So you uh -huh. could build yourself, basically. I think that's what they were trying to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, you could create characters with sliders and you could put uh -huh. your own skin tone and then you could sort of try out different makeups on yourself kind of thing or on your skin type anyway interesting um, yeah yeah and what, what about fashion is there a, like any application uh to that in fashion fashion <laughs> yeah <laughs> i get so many people like loads of people like fashion i i just refuse to do fashion jobs now because oh, really know, somebody will ring you up and they'll be like mm, can you scan uh you know 20 outfits like prada outfits or whatever and we'll be like yeah theoretically as long as they're not pure black or transparent or they don't have holes in them <laughs> or they haven't got any shiny bits or you know they're not too long and then someone will just turn up in a pure black leather like cat suit uh -oh. and it just happens every single time <laughs> seriously <laughs> yeah yeah so we stopped we just sort of stopped doing it because scanning doesn't meet the expectations of the fashion world um, okay because they sort of think you know it's just going to be an exact 3d copy of you know their clothing but in reality there's errors in it and there's you know 
the okay. textures don't work on shiny materials and you know it's, it's always a lot of work <clears throat> okay so uh, like it just doesn't make sense for you as a business or you think it's just uh too expensive complicated for existing technology it's yeah it could definitely be done if like um you wanted to spend the time doing it if you know what i mean no, the but, time means like money yeah yeah it's, it's expensive because so for an example like a if somebody came in wearing a ballerina's costume with a you know like a little tutu or something yeah, yeah. and they were like we need to scan this I'm oh like, no, my god do you know what i mean you would have to completely I've just, I've just imagined the you know <laughs> it's oh, just no. a horrible mess it would just be like a sort of scanned kind of yeah. goo so you they would then go well this doesn't this isn't what we want so then you'd be like okay i've got to make a tutu exactly the same as their you know requirements and that's going to take you like a week or uh -huh. you know, four days or something so you're already moving away from the scanning which you've quoted them for and then it's it just becomes yeah. a nightmare <clears throat> yeah so maybe like there's still like examples where actual like modeling or sculpting makes more sense than actual scanning yeah, exactly and, and i think fashion is quite possibly one of those and i think the best way to do it is to do the scan for the fashion uh, client and then just take that away and use it as reference but mm -hmm. the, the hard thing is explaining to to the client that you know they're not going to get it's not a 3D photograph like they, they would, you know, hope mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. won't hold up on the front cover of Time magazine. Yeah. <laughs> so finishing up with the technology, just like one last thing that I wanted your opinion on. Like, mm -hmm. do you think 3D scanning uh, will ever move the direction where uh, there will be like household 3D scanners? I mean, not household necessarily. Maybe that's not the right way to put it, but something mm -hmm. that uh, a business can easily use like in-house just like you know buy a bunch of cameras or buy a setup like if it's like a giant box just buy a giant box and do not outsource it uh to like amazing 2024 but instead just like press a button and get it done yeah i think mm -hmm. that's an option i all. think it already is i think there already are there's a company called doob i think they're called i think they make kind of like a sort of egg thing uh -huh. kind of get in and it's got lots of cameras and it takes a picture and it's like an off-the-shelf kind of system mm -hmm. but the thing the, so the problem with scanning people, um, the reason we have so many cameras is that, so if you, uh, for example, let's say like you had like a scanner that was on your phone, a household mm -hmm. scanner, and you tried to scan my hand, like my hand is moving the whole time. And that, that's the issue with scanning is the movement. So like, you know, right. 30 seconds it takes, my hand's probably moved a centimeter. So the hand's going to be a centimeter thicker either way, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's always why we have so many cameras, because we need to get every single angle instantaneously. Um, and right. that's sort of the issue with consumer body scanners because you okay. need a big space so it needs to be a big thing so it's always going to be a little bit niche because unless they can find a way to actually pause time then, yeah you know it's going to be pretty hard to yeah, sort of yeah. get every angle instantaneously but in terms of scanning like a you know like a, a mouse or you know an object i think definitely there'll be there already are little scanners out for your phones and yeah you know, for sure but i mean if we're talking about like tiny things it's yeah, maybe yeah. easier than easier. you know like mm. like putting a whole human in a yeah. box that's always going to be quite difficult <laughs> just because of the requirements <laughs> yeah yeah just because of the scale as well like exactly, if it's a tiny yeah. human maybe yes but <laughs> yeah but ai might might just you might just be able to take a picture and it'll reconstruct you well yeah sorry going back to your notion of ai doing all the job <laughs> and us just like you know sitting back and just yeah. watching it like yeah all this happen all right cool so um and uh how do you like now currently go about you know like learning all this and upgrading as a company do you go to like uh, uh events conferences or uh do you just do whatever you already do but do like really well what's your strategy about this kind of adapting new things uh, so we, we we don't really go to any events. We're terrible uh -huh. at it. <laughs> so, I... Really, really bad. I wish I did. I wish I went, but I just don't. Uh, it's because we're so busy. We never have time. So we never have any downtime ever. Like I don't remember the last time uh -oh. we didn't have any work. Um, so that's quite a big thing for us is just constantly being busy. Um, so yeah, in terms of sort of adaptive kind of upgrades, um, I think I'm not really sure where we're going to go next. We're, we're we probably will look at 4D at some point, but uh, I think I was explaining to you earlier, like our business model is a little bit different in that we're not we're not heavily focused on providing service work. We're sort of looking quite a lot 
more in depth now our online side of things like selling on our scan store and um, we're building a new sort of uh, a big uh, digital sales site for artists to sell their tutorials and things on like a, a mm -hmm. marketplace um, and we're spending a lot of time on that um, so we're, I think we're moving very more. interesting yeah it's called bad ship it's a new endeavor we've, we've been working on it for about a year now um, but that's a lot still, of work for you guys yeah that's it yeah we just we never have any time to to really do anything else we're building another scanner um, which I can't really talk about um, okay it's not a 4d scanner it's not a body scanner it's a different it's an experiment well I'm um, looking forward to you know like <laughs> yeah. catching catching up with you in like several months or a year time yeah, yeah. to actually I think it'll be, learn more about that yeah it's a really interesting one I'm, I'm quite excited about it um, but it's yeah it's not anything anyone's really done yet so Oh, wow. Yeah, when do you think that secret project is going to be like up in the market? I don't know. It's taken me Give it a year. Well, it still doesn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's taken me about two years and it still doesn't work. So um, hopefully I think I've cracked it. So I think um, hopefully the next year we'll, I'll be able to start using it. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, like super exciting, but I, I can't <laughs> imagine what like, you know, what, what innovation really looks like. It's not always sexy. No, so. it's definitely not sexy. It's just... <laughs> A mess. <laughs> a lot of work. A yeah. mess and a lot of work. Okay. So is that uh, your next challenge, kind of? A? Uh, yeah, that and the bad ship our marketplace. That that's the really big one. That's the you know we've got so much work to do on that. And yeah. ta tax meetings. <laughs> okay, but I think this one is already uh, live. No. Bad ship. Uh, yeah. We launched. A, we did like a sort of launch page. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we haven't actually released the site yet. We're still looking for people to you know, okay. sell their stuff and, you know, we're still working on the site. It's a massive, okay. massive endeavor. Yeah. Well, and uh, in addition to all the huge clients that you guys work with, I'm sure they also require a lot of attention and, yeah, definitely. Uh, you yeah. know, all of your, yeah, a lot of time. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. So look, we're actually almost running out of time. I'm just going to really? move to, <laughs> yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, one well, quickly, but um, I still have the other uh, portion of things to cover. Okay. So uh, we still have my favorite 10 questions that, right. uh, uh, that we need to go uh, with. So um, I'm just going to ask you several things where you've <laughs> got, um, yeah, you've got, let's say, a couple of phrases to reply. Ooh, That's scary. a traditional, traditional <laughs> questionnaire in the end. Okay. Uh, but yeah. So, uh, what's your favorite place in the world? In the world? Uh, it's, it's probably Scotland. I like Scotland. But you're from Belfast. Yeah, I'm from Belfast. And I've traveled a lot all over the world. I spent lots, many years traveling around. Um, but yeah, Scotland's still my favorite place. Okay. Yeah. It's, Any it's specific not, reason? It's just beautiful. I just think it's the most beautiful place in the world. Just like, it doesn't matter when you go or like where you go. It doesn't matter if it's raining or snowing or hail or sunshine. It's just amazing. Okay. The scenery is just beautiful. <clears throat> Definitely have to put it on my list. Have you never been to Scotland? Like, yeah, never. Actually, oh been to so many places in the UK, but yeah, not oh, Scotland. Right. No, Scotland's okay. it's a place to go. <clears throat> okay, now I know. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're working, what are you normally listening to, if anything? Uh a lot of stuff anything that isn't pop music basically uh i tend to just let my spotify kind of just go do its own thing um, <laughs> i've been listening to a lot of oasis recently uh to a lot of oasis a lot oh, of like, okay oasis. Pop, like reliving my youth okay <laughs> um, love that yeah <laughs> and uh what's your uh favorite way to or like your best way to gain inspiration um i think uh probably not working Mm -hmm. I think probably taking a break um, and not working at all and like clearing your mind of work. Cause I think when you're complete, sorry, I meant to answer in like one word and I two words. Uh, that's fine. No, 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 uh, no. I don't want to. You're, you're allowed to answer with more <laughs> words now. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Just, just relaxing basically. That's when your brain wanders and you go into that like creative mode and you start thinking about things and you know, just worrying about work. Just a, a follow-up question on that. Do you actually do much of creative work now? Only in my brain. <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't really get to do anything. I don't have time. It's really annoying. I would love to. I, I actually put, bought a computer home because I don't have a computer in my house because uh, I wanted to completely separate 
Um, so I ended up bringing one home, thinking, oh, you know, I'll spend the evenings, and but it just never happens. I would love to. I would love to have two months just to make something really cool, make a film or something. Um, but sounds good, make yeah. a film. Yeah, that's what I'd like to do, but a sci-fi. But yeah, right. So like. Um, like uh, with a lot of VFX or? I think just something 2001 Space Odyssey kind of drifty <laughs> floaty music pretty you know that sort of thing something a bit arty and cool. Right. Um, I just like I just think I'd find that really relaxing you know. Okay but, well that sounds like um, a huge project but yeah, it would be. It'd be massive. I'd probably get really stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. In the end, it, it doesn't sound like no. something like clearing your brain. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> okay, so that leads me to the next one. Um, what's your big life goal? Ooh. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, so what I really want to do isn't 3D or 3D modeling or animation or any of that stuff. Like, um, I... It's going to sound really cliched, so I would I would quite like to, uh, whatever happens with this, I would like to make enough money to be able to do something like a uh, good. If you know what I mean, I'm quite interested in doing something with homeless people, and like I don't really quite know what I want to do yet, but I've got mm -hmm. a few ideas and things. But I think that's going to be something I'm going to do later in my life, you know, in my fifties or something. Um, but that would be that's what I really want to do, if you know what I mean, and building up this business and potentially, you know, selling it or making enough money to be able to have some sort of meaningful impact would be kind of my life goal, I guess. Mm -hmm. That does but, not sound cliche at all. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I haven't made a start on it yet. So, <laughs> 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 well, you know, like uh, we spoke about Salim who was here uh, with me just uh, several weeks back. Salim wanted a red Ferrari. I keep oh, remembering he? that. Yes, yeah, so you know, like <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> I would quite a... like a red Ferrari as well. <laughs> it can, can be start. Yeah, 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 can develop. <laughs> yeah, or I mean, like that could be a good indicator that you can move to the next one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Once yeah. I have enough money to buy a red Ferrari. Then... <laughs> yeah, you definitely do good with the same money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh. I don't know pineapple juice probably oh <laughs> you mean okay. like al alcoholic drink whichever uh i don't know so i'm one of these people i don't really like the taste of alcohol um oh. but i do drink it uh sometimes i like beer like sometimes i don't <laughs> yeah yeah i just i like the effects i don't really like the uh, taste um okay so uh alcoholic drink i like uh like rum i like dark rum okay um, and pineapple juice, so I guess they go Rub, together. Oh, right, there goes go. together. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <Thanks. laughs> yeah, cocktail, James. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, so, uh, what's the first thing that you do in the morning when you wake up? Uh, check my email. Right. Like, or look at my phone. Okay. The, the sad reality is probably everyone else does that as well. Addiction. But, yeah, phone addiction. <clears throat> yeah. But, yeah. So. If you did not initially become a digital artist, uh, what do you think you would be now? What's Ooh. your backup career? Uh, I always, so I loved science when I was a kid. I always wanted to be like a, I guess my ideal job would be something where I could daydream and ask somebody else to do the, the theoretical, the, the actual physical side of it. So probably like a, like a theoretical physicist or like something oh. along those lines would be probably my ideal job. Are you moving closer to that with your new camera project? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> okay, good. Maybe a little bit. Maybe there's a bit of physics, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, okay, amazing. Yeah. And um, uh, can you recommend any, like, a book or a movie? Like, some of your favourites. Oh, my favourite books? Uh, so my favourite books are um, Dark Tower series by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. uh, they're amazing, I love them. Uh, consider Phlebas. Um, so other favorite book um favorite movies are i like so many films but probably the film i would always watch would be probably alien or aliens All i don't right. know which one i think aliens is better okay because i enjoy it more it's a bit yeah, I expected con to controversial hear a space odyssey here uh no i'm not a big fan it's all right okay <laughs> good <Yeah. laughs> right and uh, uh who are some of your legends some of the people that you admire I mean, uh, in the industry or not, 
doesn't have to be. Oh, okay. Uh, probably. Hmm. Uh, so, don't, no, I don't think any of the people I admire, are sort of, you know, mm -hmm. my real legends, are in the animation industry. Although there are obviously a lot of people that I admire. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Spriggs is probably one of my favorite artists. Okay. He's, he's amazing. Um, but in terms of like sort of people outside the industry, I think uh, probably like David Attenborough, obviously. Uh, okay. Bill Gates. I just think he's somebody who has had a you know, a very sort of a lot of opportunity just to be greedy and, you know, sort of yeah. spend his money on himself, but actually, you know, cured smallpox and, you know, is an amazing guy. Um, and oh, Elon Musk, obviously. Yes. A genius. <laughs> Finally. Gotta have Musk. <laughs> Finally, yes. <laughs> I mean, he's probably my number one. He's probably my favorite, but I think the other two have done so much more in terms of. So actually, they deserve being on top of their. Of I think the list. so. I think when Musk, you know, he, he's probably going to save the world at some point, but. Um, yeah. But the time hasn't come yet. Not quite, I think. But well, I think he will. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Let's, again, like, let's check back in a year or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, finally, uh, what are some of your things on, what are some of the things on your bucket list? On my bucket list? Oh, if you uh, have one. Uh, well, I think, like I said earlier, do something charitable that's kind mm -hmm. of worthwhile. That's number one, probably. Um, I would quite like to see the Earth from space before I die. I think that'd be quite a cool thing. Um, we can leave uh, that at two. Pardon? We can leave this list at two. This yeah, is I think yeah. <laughs> Earth from space. That'd be pretty mega, though. Like, but That's I don't know. Red. I'll probably be dead before that could even happen. Oh, come on. Yeah. Like, yeah, mm. that's that's not well, a very optimistic way of thinking. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. I think those are the two things that I think about the most. That I would quite like. I would like to do. Whether I'll ever do either of those is a very different thing. Well, okay, <laughs> we'll check back. We'll see. Check back in <laughs> twenty <laughs> years. <laughs> okay. Oh my God, I, I'm not sure if my calendar will survive until this. If I set this <laughs> reminder <probably> now, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> All right. So that was actually the one, the last one on my list, and uh, oh, right, okay. I'm 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 quite glad that. Uh, um, that, yeah, that we went through all of this without actually crossing the time uh, limit. Oh, cool. Yeah, anyways, uh, James, thank you so much for, okay, no for coming pleasure. on the show. Yeah, and, thank uh, you for asking me. Yeah, no, it's just been uh, so much of an of amazing information and I hope that uh, people that are listening to it got like all this value that, uh, uh, that uh, I got because I got so, all of my questions answered. <laughs> now I know cool. so much, too much. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, all if, right. anyone wants to, if anyone wants to ask me anything, they can Facebook me or email me. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave all the show notes here, uh, just uh, below the audio or video, whatever cool. um, you guys are listening to, watching. So yeah, thank you, again. Thank you James, again. Oh my gosh, this is too late. <laughs> the time start, start calling you something else. Anyways, and uh, yeah, have a nice evening. Thank you so cool. much for you connecting. Too. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you like this episode, please, Leave us a comment. It means a lot to us. Also, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type it right here. And if you're listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting platform, review us. Your five stars mean a lot to us. On the side note, here at Art Heroes Academy, we're releasing a 3D printing program by the end of the month and waitlist registrations are already open. We're really excited to release this program made by Martin Verhoeven to all of you guys. So if you're interested in 3D printing, the waitlist registrations are open at artheroes.co and see you all there and tune in in a week for more podcasting fun. Cheers! Thanks for listening to Art Heroes Podcast. Check out www.artheroes.co for show notes, more interviews, and free tools made for you by our team of mentors. Tune in next week for more inspiration. And keep up the great work, hero.